Before I get started, I just want to say that if you've been subscribed to me for a while, this title and thumbnail may look kind of familiar to you, and that's because this is an updated version of a video that I originally posted in 2022. It's the same concept, but to be honest, I was unhappy with the original video and I wanted to redo it from scratch, so this video has a completely new script and new footage. It's new and improved. I'm going to keep doing this with a lot of my old videos, so if that's something you want to see, stay tuned. If you had asked me five years ago what my favorite movie of all time was, I would have told you that it was Whiplash. But a close second would be Bohemian Rhapsody. You know, the Queen movie. Allow me to explain, and also kind of defend myself. In December of 2018, I was very early into my teenage years and I went to go see Bohemian Rhapsody in theaters with my best friend at the time because she and a ton of other people I knew absolutely loved it. So I went to see it even though I really was not a Queen fan and I didn't know anything about the band. It's kind of embarrassing but I didn't even know Freddie Mercury was gay. And I didn't even know anything about the film either, only that it was starring the guy from Night at the Museum, which is one of the greatest pieces of queer cinema ever conceived. And the second I saw it, I was hooked. I became a huge fan of the band, and especially the film. I saw it three more times in theaters, I bought the DVD, I followed the entire cast on social media, and I even got this book. Bohemian Rhapsody, or Bo Rap, became a huge obsession of mine and defined the next year or so of my life. I adored the film, its cast, and the music it was centered around, and I never really understood why the film was criticized the way it was. But my obsession was kind of a double-edged sword. As I fell more and more in love with Bo Rap and with Queen, I wanted to know everything about the band and their story, and I wanted to know everything about how the film was made. And as I did more and more research, a lot of really serious flaws started to reveal themselves, and as I got older, I was able to think more critically about the media I was consuming. And when I revisited the movie for the first time in months... Something much sinister, more, more sinister yeah. arose. Bo Rap is a mess. And it's a mess on several levels, in several ways, that are surprisingly complicated to explain. There's a lot going on under the surface, and some of it is genuinely very insidious and harmful, and I'd like to explain it to you here today. The good, the bad, and the queen. So what is Bo Rap about? Well, that's simple. It's about Queen. The movie covers the span of their career, from their formation in 1970, all the way up to their performance at Live Aid in 1985. Really, it's your standard musical biopic. Like, it's probably the most conventional, vanilla example of the entire genre. We need to get experimental. But what story is Bo Rap trying to tell? More than anything, it's a story about Freddie Mercury. It's about him navigating his career, his personal relationships, and his identity. A major focus of the movie is about Freddie's sexuality. Although the real Freddy never explicitly labeled his identity in that sense, at least not to the public, he was known to have relationships with both men and women. Bo Rap deals with these relationships, as well as his eventual death due to AIDS, which is not shown on screen. But that wasn't always the case. While Bo Rap may seem like a basic, by-the-book retelling of real events, the movie we got was wildly different from what it was envisioned as. This movie had an extremely long and troubled production that spanned nearly a decade and honestly might be a more interesting story than the one we saw on screen. There had been talks about making a movie about Queen as early as 2010. Two of the three living members of Queen, Brian May and Roger Taylor, were heavily involved in the project and continued to be involved the entire way through. Queen bassist John Deacon, who retired in 1997, had nothing to do with the making of the film. In an interview with the BBC, BBC, Queen guitarist Brian May confirmed that while the film was still in its early stages, Sasha Baron Cohen had been cast as Freddy and the script was being written by Peter Morgan, who would later go on to create The Crown. A year later, in 2011, May said that the film was progressing even though he still had his reservations. He specifically stressed the importance of honoring Freddie Mercury's legacy. Speaking to the Daily Record, he said, quote, 
Obviously, we go into it with a great amount of enthusiasm, but also a certain amount of caution because Freddy's legacy is very precious and we have a great responsibility not to mess it up. It is more about Freddy than it is about us, and that is deliberately so. We have resisted making this film for a long time, and it is only now we feel we have the right people that we have given it the okay. However, in 2013, we get our first minor controversy as Sasha Baron Cohen leaves the project due to creative differences. To this day, there are conflicting stories as to what exactly those creative differences were. Brian and Roger claim that Sasha's reputation as a comedic actor would distract audiences and prevent them from taking the film seriously, but Sasha himself tells a very different story. He maintains that he had a very different vision of the film than Brian and Roger did. He wanted an R-rated film that explicitly showcased the sex, drugs, and rock and roll of Freddy's life, while Brian and Roger wanted a PG-13 rated movie that would appeal to a wider audience. They also allegedly had issues with the writers and directors Sasha wanted to bring on for the film. According to Sasha, they didn't approve of screenwriter Peter Morgan, who I mentioned a second ago. Cohen also had two directors in mind for the film. David Fincher, who has directed a slew of absolute classics like Fight Club, The Social Network, and Gone Girl, and Tom Hooper, who directed Cats. I have to say that a gritty, R-rated drama about Freddie Mercury, directed by David Fincher, sounds fantastic. Sasha Baron Cohen also cited a major disagreement with Brian and Roger about the timeline of the script. My first meeting, I should have never carried on because a member of the band, I won't say who, said... Brian um, May. <laughs> I won't say it, yeah. but he said, you know, this is such a great movie because it's got such an amazing thing happens in the middle of the movie. Uh -huh. I go, well, what happens in the middle of the movie? He goes, uh, you know, Freddie dies. <laughs> middle of the movie. I go, all oh, right. I go, all right. <laughs> so you mean it's a bit like Pulp Fiction? You know, the end is the middle, and the middle is the end. Right, I go, all right. right that's right. really <laughs> that's a wild that's a wild <laughs> movie. All right, that's interesting. I never thought about that. He goes, no, 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 normal movie. <laughs> I go, so wait a minute, what happens in the second half of the movie? He said, well, you know, we see how the band carries on from strength to strength. Oh, oh. Again, none of this has been confirmed. It's Sasha's word against Brian and Rogers, though mostly Brian's because, as you may have noticed, he's the one doing all the talking. If I had to give my two cents on this, which I don't, but I'm gonna, I would say that Sasha is probably telling more of the truth. I don't think Brian and Roger were lying when they said they believed Sasha's presence in the film would be distracting for audiences, but I also don't think Sasha is lying about his disagreements with them. There's plenty of evidence to support what he's saying. First of all, Brian and Roger have said themselves that they wanted a PG-13 film. Second of all, if you look online, you can allegedly find the third draft of what would become the script. It's... well, it's not very good. And I'm not completely sure it's real, but it does include Freddy's death and the way the surviving members carried on afterwards. So I'd be willing to bet that Sasha was telling the truth. And I'd also be willing to bet that the unnamed band member he mentioned was Brian. So if Sasha Baron Cohen left the project, who's gonna play Freddie Mercury? The answer is, obviously, Ben Wishaw. Around that same time, Dexter Fletcher signed on to direct the film. But that didn't last long, because in 2014, Fletcher left the project, citing, once again, creative differences, this time with producer Graham King. Later that same year, Ben Wishaw claimed that the film was on hold due to problems with the script. And seven months after that, in 2015, Ben Wishaw also left the project, although Johnny Flynn had been cast as Roger Taylor and Gemma Arterton had been cast as Mary Austin, Freddie's former partner. By November, screenwriter Anthony McCartan signed on to write a new script. The rough draft I mentioned earlier would date back to around this time. And by 2016, a new director had signed on, and Rami Malek had been cast as Freddie Mercury. 2017 was a pretty big year. In July, it was announced that the rest of the band had been cast. Willem Lee would play Brian May, Ben Hardy would replace Johnny Flynn as Roger Taylor, and Joe Mazzello would play John Deacon. Lucy Boynton was also replacing Gemma Arterton as Mary Austin. In August, yet another version of the script was being written by Justin Haith. And in September of 2017, after seven years in development hell, Bohemian Rhapsody finally began filming. But we are not out of the woods yet. This, this is where things get bad. From the very beginning, the onset environment was an absolute nightmare entirely because of the director. 
Some days, he wouldn't show up to work, leaving cinematographer Thomas Siegel to step in and direct the film. Some days, he would show up to work, and by all accounts, that was even worse. He was extremely unprofessional on set, causing issues with several members of the cast. Tom Hollander, who played Queen's manager Jim Beach, allegedly left the film because of the director's behavior, but was later convinced to return. There were also rumors of Rami Malek himself issuing a complaint with the studio after a physical confrontation in which the director threw an object. And after the Thanksgiving holiday, he stopped coming to set entirely, allegedly to care for a sick parent. On December 1st, 2017, filming was put on hold, and on December 4th, with only two weeks left of filming, the director was fired from the film. Dexter Fletcher once again stepped in to finish directing the film. He, he really yeah, okay, he brought not, the movie home. No, 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 we're not going to do this. It's, it's Why not? Okay, go ahead, John. No, this, hey, <laughs> it, it was tumultuous for a while, and then he yeah, stepped in. You're right. very kind. And then it was smooth sailing from then on. And <laughs> exactly. Dexter's energy is exactly what we needed. The Directors Guild of America has a clause in all of its studio contracts that there can only be one director per film, and the DGA has the right to decide who that director is. And because Dexter Fletcher didn't oversee production, and he wasn't there for the majority of filming, he doesn't get director's credit, even though he completed work on the film. He is credited as a producer. And in January of 2018, filming was completed, presumably without further incident. And on October 24th, 2018, Bohemian Rhapsody hit theaters eight years after it was first announced to the public. Those eight years were absolute chaos. But did anything good come of this chaos? Was it worth it? Is this movie any good? No. Bo-Rap first started getting backlash before it was even out in theaters. The first trailer for the movie drew criticism for showcasing Freddie's relationship with Mary Austin and not any of the men in his life. The trailer also didn't mention his AIDS diagnosis, and the film's official synopsis referred to it as a life-threatening illness. In response to this backlash, the following trailers did feature brief clips of Freddie with other men, though Mary was still a prominent feature, and the synopsis was updated to mention AIDS by name. After Bo Rap was released, it continued to face a variety of criticisms for a variety of reasons, and I'm going to lay them out for you now, starting out with relatively small nitpicks and then building to bigger crimes. What's interesting about Bo Rap is that it initially became controversial for its lack of controversy. Not behind the scenes, of course, but on screen. Despite everything I just said, at the time the movie came out, the general consensus from critics was that the movie was just fine. In fact, it was maybe a little bit bland, especially for an experimental band like Queen. We need to get experimental. This movie has pretty much every single cliche you would find in a musical biopic. A talented musician becomes extremely famous, but oh no, their fame has led them into a self-destructive path of drug addiction and probably also being a little bit of a slut. They're being manipulated by someone in their life, probably a manager, romantic partner, or both, and they're alienating the people who really care about them. After hitting rock bottom, usually through some near-death experience, they turn themselves around, and the movie ends with a bunch of text explaining what ended up happening to everyone. Bo Rap was formulaic, it was derivative, it was PG-13, which seemed like a bunch of odd choices to make when the real Freddy was, by all accounts, exactly the opposite. See, we don't want to repeat ourselves the same formula over and over. Formulas are a complete and utter waste of time. Yeah, formulas work. Let's stick with the formulas. I like formulas. Ultimately, it seemed like the movie was afraid of a little risk. It didn't feel at all reflective of the person Freddie Mercury was. I mean, Freddie Mercury himself said that if a film was ever made about his life, it would have to be X-rated. Freddie Mercury did a lot of things throughout his life that you could not put in a family-friendly movie, so the raunchier aspects of his life, like drug use and sex, are only implied, not shown on screen. You don't see Freddie Mercury do coke, but you see the residue on a table. You don't see him having sex, but you see a bunch of dudes show up at his house in the middle of the night. And as a result, throughout the film, it feels like we're being told and not shown. We're meant to have the impression that Freddy is this wild, crazy party animal, but we're not really seeing the evidence to support that. 
honestly, when I rewatched this movie in order to make the video, what shocked me the most was how boring it was. Everybody loves to bring up that one quote of Freddy's, you know, when he was on his deathbed, he said, you can do whatever you want with my music or my legacy. I don't care. Just don't make me boring. He said to me, I haven't given you anything in my will. You're my executor. You can do anything with my legacy. You can do anything with my music, but never make me boring. But unfortunately, that's kind of exactly what Bo Rap does. It made Freddie Mercury boring. This movie also got majorly clowned on for its editing. And yeah, to be honest, there are some sequences in this film that are just embarrassing. I feel alive. I'll turn it Case in point, the infamous scene where the band first meets with John Reed, their manager. There are people much more qualified than me who have made entire videos about this scene alone. But I don't have to be qualified to know that the editing here is insane. I didn't add in any cuts here, by the way. The pacing is just that weird. And it's not just the editing. The blocking is off, the shots are framed in a really weird way. To me, it looks as though they weren't able to get any wide shots, which they really needed for a scene like this. This movie probably could have benefited from a few reshoots, but I can understand why that didn't happen. By far, the biggest complaint that people have about this movie is its complete disregard for historical accuracy. And usually I'm not the type of person to nitpick things like that, but Borat makes a lot of changes for the sake of storytelling that are really questionable, which leads me to a segment that I like to call the historical inaccuracy bonanza. Some of you may remember the humans interlude bonanza from my gorilla song ranking video. This is kind of a similar concept. The initials are the same. I'm basically just gonna go kind of quickly through the more minor historical inaccuracies in this movie before I really start unpacking the big bad ones. One, in the film, Freddy goes to see Brian and Roger's band Smile in concert, and this is where he meets Mary Austin for the first time. That same night, Smile's singer slash bassist, Tim Staffel, quits the band. Humpy bone. Humpy bone. Freddy then introduces himself to Brian and Roger, and Queen is formed shortly afterwards. In reality, Freddy had already known Tim and Brian and had even lived with Roger prior to joining the band. He also had been interested in joining Smile since before Tim left. He didn't meet Mary Austin until after he joined the band, and for a time, she had actually been dating Brian May. Two. In the film, John Deacon was the first and only bassist of Queen. In reality, he was the fourth. Three. In the film, some songs are shown being written and recorded out of chronological order. For example, the band performs Fat Bottom Girls on tour in the US in 1974, and Brian May is seen writing We Will Rock You in 1980. In reality, Fat Bottom Girls wasn't released until 1978, and We Will Rock You was released in 1977. 4. An antagonist of sorts in the film is an executive at EMI, the label the band was signed to, by the name of Ray Foster, played by Mike Myers. Ray discourages the band from releasing their song Bohemian Rhapsody as a single, stifling their creative vision. Because of the disagreement, the band quits EMI. In reality, Ray Foster never existed, and the character is based on EMI executive Roy Featherstone, who was actually a fan of the band. Featherstone did originally refuse to release Bohemian Rhapsody as a single, but it was eventually chosen as the lead single because of public demand after Freddie's good friend Kenny Everett had been promoting the song on his radio show. And Queen actually remained signed with EMI until as recently as 2010, long after Freddie had died. 5. Speaking of Kenny Everett, in the film he is shown as a friend of Freddie's who Mary suspects he's cheating on her with. In reality, they were never together. They were close friends until a falling out in 1985, although they did manage to reconcile before their deaths. 6. In the film, Queen is shown performing in Rio in 1979. In reality, the concert the audio was taken from occurred in 1985. 7. In the film, John Reed, Queen's manager, is fired after trying to convince Freddie to leave Queen in favor of a solo career. In reality, he parted ways with the band in 1978. It was a mutual decision, and as far as I know, there were no hard feelings. 8. 
In the film, before performing at Live Aid, Queen decides to start sharing songwriting credits on all of their albums, so all their songs would just be credited as being written by Queen, rather than any individual member. In reality, they didn't adopt this practice until 1989. 9. In the film, Queen was a last-minute addition to the Live Aid setlist. They were out of practice and had to rehearse in order to get back in shape for the show. In reality, Queen had been on tour just two months before Live Aid and they were already plenty prepared. 10. In the film, two songs are excluded from the Live Aid performance, Crazy Little Thing Called Love and We Will Rock You. In reality, they did perform these songs in between Hammer to Fall and We Are the Champions. I kind of have to give the movie a pass here though because they did recreate the entire Live Aid performance exactly as it happened and those two songs are included on the extended cut of the film. 11. In the film, Freddie is diagnosed with AIDS and informs the band of this diagnosis before Live Aid in 1985. In reality, Freddie wasn't diagnosed until 1987. This choice in particular was criticized by a lot of people because it does seem pretty ghoulish to mess around with the timing of a very important and tragic event to better suit the supposedly true story you're trying to tell. And 12. In the film, Freddy chooses to go solo, which causes the band to split up. In reality, that just straight up did not happen. In fact, Freddy was not the first member of Queen to go solo. He was third. Roger Taylor released a solo single in 1977 and two solo albums in 1981 and 1984. Brian May released a solo EP in 1983, whereas Freddie's first solo album didn't come out until 1985, and at no point did Queen ever split up. Thus concludes the historical inaccuracy bonanza. And I'm really just scratching the surface here. Once again, there are people much more qualified than me who have made entire videos about this. But let's go back to that last point. Bohemian Rhapsody attempts to frame Freddy as being responsible for the band's breakup, a breakup that never even happened. Why would a movie about Freddie Mercury try to hold him accountable for things he didn't do? Why would they make him look worse than he was? And that's the real issue with Bohemian Rhapsody, well, one of them anyway. Bohemian Rhapsody mishandles Freddy's story in a way that's clumsy, awkward, and ultimately irresponsible. While Freddie Mercury is the film's protagonist, the heart of the film, its moral center, is not Freddie. It's Mary Austin. She is the one he truly loves, the one who keeps him grounded, the one who saves him when he becomes led astray. In this film, they are soulmates. And I don't mean to diminish the real-life relationship that Freddie and Mary had. For all I know, they could have been soulmates. Even after their romantic relationship ended, they were a constant in each other's lives and Freddie clearly cared about her very much. He left her half his estate, and to this day she is the only person on earth who knows where his ashes are buried. There's absolutely no issue with depicting Freddie's relationships with women in a film like this. Ultimately, it's useless to speculate on the nature of Freddie's sexuality and relationships. It's not up to us to decide whether Freddie was gay or bisexual. A film about Freddie Mercury's life can and should depict the full spectrum of his relationships. The issue I have with the depiction of Freddie and Mary in Bohemian Rhapsody is that there's a certain amount of morality tied to their relationship. It's really quite simple. When Freddie is with Mary, things are good. When Freddie is with other people, other men, things are bad. The exception is Jim Hutton. In the film, Freddie first meets Jim during a party at his mansion in 1981. He's already deep into his downward spiral of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Jim is working as a waiter, and their meet cute consists of Freddie pinching Jim's ass without his consent. Ah, how sweet. In reality, Jim was a hairdresser, and he and Freddie met in a nightclub in 1983. While they didn't start dating until much later, they remained together until the day Freddie died. They lived together, they wore wedding rings even though they couldn't legally marry. Towards the end of Freddy's life, Jim became his caretaker. None of this is in the movie. Obviously, this is because the timeline of the film doesn't quite get there, but as a whole, Freddy's relationship with Jim isn't given nearly as much emotional significance as his relationship with Mary. Jim himself isn't given as much characterization as Mary. 
Someone who was given a fair bit of characterization is Paul Prenter. In the film, Paul Prenter manages the band and he and Freddie begin an affair while Freddie is still engaged to Mary. He is the devil on Freddie's shoulder, pulling him into a hedonistic lifestyle of drugs and orgies with other men. The best example of this would be the film's club scene. I, I know I was in the middle of making a point about Paul Prenter, but I have to pause for a moment because I have to talk about this scene. This is a montage in which we see Freddy in a nightclub, surrounded by men, being led through the crowd by Paul. It's obviously representative of gay club culture and the nightlife Freddy enjoyed throughout the 80s, partying, clubbing, and sleeping with other men. The club is cast in a very sinister red light, and you're meant to understand that this is a bad thing Freddy is doing. So, in shorter terms, it's a scene that takes place in a gay club during the very beginning of the AIDS epidemic, and Freddy, as well as dozens of other men, are implied to be having gay sex. And which song did they choose for this scene? Another one bites the dust. I cannot believe that this film was in development for as long as it was, and at no point in time did anyone stop to think about the implications of choosing this song for that scene. How many stages of production did this movie go through without one person stopping to say, hey, maybe using a song called Another One Bites the Dust in a scene that foreshadows the protagonist's eventual AIDS diagnosis is a bad idea. I, legit I legitimately cannot wrap my head around this. It is insane to me that this was allowed to happen, and I refuse to even entertain the thought that it might have been done on purpose. It's incompetent at best and downright offensive at worst. In addition to manipulating Freddy, Paul Prenter also manipulates John Reed into encouraging Freddy to go solo, knowing it would get him fired. In this movie, Paul is pretty much solely responsible for Freddy's downfall. He isolates him from Mary and the rest of Queen, purposely withholding their calls. After Mary finally gets through to him in person, Freddy snaps out of it and both breaks up with and fires Paul. Fruit fly. In retaliation, Paul then goes public with his relationship with Freddy, disclosing intimate details of his sex life. So Paul Prenter is pretty obviously the villain of this movie. Paul is out. I fired him. On what pretext? Villainy. But like the rest of the movie's events, only bits and pieces of this story actually happened. Paul did sell Freddy's story to the public, but via a newspaper in 1987, not on a talk show in 1985. He also never worked for John Reed, he was a DJ who later became Freddie Mercury's personal assistant. And he was fired for throwing a party at Freddie's house without his permission. Not for, you know, ruining Freddie's life. What's interesting about this part of the movie is that Freddy himself has next to no agency. His major conflict throughout the story is that of his sexuality, which leads him into a self-destructive lifestyle. Bowrap doesn't frame this lifestyle as something he chose. His first kiss with Paul wasn't really mutual, Paul just kind of grabs his face and from then on, queerness is something that is thrust upon him. What this movie tries to tell you is that despite the sex and the drugs and the lavish parties, Freddy is absolutely miserable without Mary and his bandmates to keep him from straying too far. Paul Prenter manipulated him into a lifestyle that he wasn't happy with. But the truth is, Freddy liked going to clubs. He liked having sex. He wasn't manipulated into that lifestyle. He wanted it, he chose it, and that's not a bad thing. But according to this movie, it is a bad thing and he needs to be saved from it by the love of his life, who just so happens to be the only woman he's seen in a relationship with. But it's too late. He's already sick, and he dies as a direct result of his immoral actions. Also, yes, this movie does include that old, tired trope of somebody coughing blood into a handkerchief, which indicates that they've contracted some terminal illness and are about to die. The movie literally <laughs> opens with a shot of Freddy coughing. Okay, starts off with coughing, that's always a good sign. This movie, intentionally or not, frames Freddie Mercury's AIDS diagnosis, and by extension, his death, as a punishment, a consequence, an inevitability, given the bad things he did. And that is just so cruel. When Freddie shares his diagnosis with his bandmates, he explicitly says, 
I don't have time to be their victim, their AIDS poster boy, their cautionary tale. But that is exactly what this movie does. Bohemian Rhapsody turns Freddie Mercury and the unapologetic, extraordinary life that he lived into a cautionary tale. Let me spell it out for you. The AIDS epidemic was a tragedy that led to so much senseless death. Nobody deserves to get AIDS because they were having gay sex. Nobody deserves to be demonized for partying or clubbing or sleeping around, and AIDS was not an inevitable consequence of that lifestyle. For this movie to imply otherwise is irresponsible, and it's, it's not fair. And then there's all this bullshit about Freddie splitting up the band. His behavior is what leads to conflict within the band and eventually drives them apart, which again, did not happen. You just kill Queen? Oh, give it a kiss one day, she might wake up. As Freddy falls deeper into this downward spiral, we see the way his choices and behavior start creating tension within the band. It's literally like that one TikTok from Adrian Gray. Band members struggle to hide his hedonism due to his powerful voice. The idea that Freddy's having these debauched backstage parties just isn't true. Would it feel good if I touch you there? That's not Freddy. What about here? Freddie's voice is higher than that, so... What if I tickle you with this light feather? Freddie is up late partying, while his straight bandmates are in bed with their wives by 9pm. Come on! Let's dance! Yes! I don't dance, Freddie. I need a few more of these for that. It's my party, and I demand you dance! You should go. To be fair, there are a few quick references throughout the film to Roger Taylor sleeping around, but it's really nothing more than lip service. Loyalty is so important, don't you think, Dominique? Careful, Fred. Freddy, sometimes you're a total prick. For what? For calling out his friend's hypocrisy and infidelity? And if we want to talk about infidelity, Brian May met his current wife in 1986. He divorced his first wife in 1988. Now, I've never been that good at math, but something about that doesn't quite add up to me. And that wasn't in the movie. I can't imagine why. You've been together <laughs> since 1986, and yeah. you got divorced from your first wife in 1988. Is that right? Uh, <laughs> slight overlap. Yeah, I'm not good on dates. Scarlet really. woman. Yeah. <laughs> also, John Deacon doesn't want to dance? Really? Dancing Deaky? Really? I mean, do they really expect us to believe that Freddie was the only member of Queen actually living a rock star's life? Oh, that's right, of course. Brian May and Roger Taylor have their fingerprints all over this movie, and they do expect you to believe that. And of course, I'm not saying Freddie was a perfect person who we're not allowed to criticize, and I'm not saying the movie should treat him that way. But this movie invents flaws for Freddie Mercury while conveniently leaving out the very real flaws that Brian May and Roger Taylor had. Like, sure, Freddie liked to party, he slept around, he did coke. So what? That's what rock stars did, that's what the rest of Queen did. And Freddie's lifestyle was never something that jeopardized the band or their career. Not only does Freddie's behavior put a strain on his friendships, it prevents the band from making music. Brian, Roger, and John are good, upstanding citizens who just want to make music. But Freddie starts showing up late to the studio, and when he does show up, he is extremely belligerent and unprofessional. He starts fights, including a near-physical confrontation with his bandmates. This sounds familiar, and, and I can't quite put my finger on why. Then, obviously, he chooses a solo career over Queen. This is framed as a bad thing, a selfish choice, even though in real life it was something that Brian May and Roger Taylor had already done at that point. In the scene where he breaks the news to the band, he snaps at them and insults them. And without me, you'd be a dentist. And you, you would be author of a fascinating dissertation on the cosmos that no one ever reads. Deaky? For the life of me, nothing comes to mind. And after the band splits, there's a scene in which Freddie runs back to the other three with his tail between his legs and apologizes. He's indebted to his bandmates. This movie wants you to believe that Freddie is nothing without them. I deserve your fury. 
I've been conceited, selfish, but an asshole, basically. Even in the scene where Freddy tells the rest of Queen that he has AIDS, Roger says, You're a legend, Fred. A very cheesy and on-the-nose line to begin with, but then they have Freddy respond by saying, We're all legends. I can practically hear Brian and Roger patting themselves on the back. Again, I have to ask, why would a movie about Freddie Mercury, made with the involvement of Brian May and Roger Taylor, try to hold him accountable for things he didn't do? Why would they try to demonize the way he lived his life? Why would they make him look worse than he was? It is so incredibly disappointing to me that Brian May and Roger Taylor would approve a film that characterizes their bandmate and their friend in this way. Obviously, they would know what Freddie would have wanted more than you or I would, but at this point I have to question if they even care about that anymore. If you ask me, they completely failed to keep their egos in check during this movie's production, and the final product really suffers because of it. Brian and Roger chose to focus on their own reputations at the cost of Freddy's when he can no longer defend himself. Again, let me spell it out for you. Brian May and Roger Taylor approved of a film in which Freddie Mercury's queerness is the implicit cause of his downfall, in which he is creepy, violent, and shockingly boring, in which he treats his bandmates like shit and then apologizes to them for it. If you don't already know the real details of Queen's career or Freddie Mercury's life, which most people don't, you're going to walk away thinking that that's how things really happened, and that's who Freddie Mercury was, and none of it is the fucking truth! Bohemian Rhapsody makes a villain out of Freddie Mercury and, by extension, other men who lived their lives the way that he did. It's inaccurate, it's irresponsible, and it's dangerous. Bohemian Rhapsody is absolutely, unquestionably, a bad movie. So maybe I don't think this movie is very good, but I don't want it to seem like I'm only focusing on the negative aspects of it, because it, it does have redeeming qualities. I mean look, even the worst movie I've ever seen, which was so bad I wouldn't even mention it by name, had redeeming qualities. And when I went back and rewatched Bo Rap to make this video, I could see why I loved this movie so much when I first saw it. And there are things that I still like about it. The soundtrack is good, that goes without saying, and the Brian May version of the 20th Century Fox theme is cool. Also, because the movie is rated PG-13, there's not a lot of swearing, which I think is dumb, but anyways. I remember the very last gig in Nebworth, Freddie said, look, I can't fucking do this anymore. Um, you have to bleep me again, won't you? <laughs> it's pretty hard to quote Freddie without swearing. Considering the fact that they only had one chance to use the F word, I think they made a pretty good choice as to when and where to use it with the line, Freddy fucking Mercury. I still think the entire Live Aid segment is great. I don't know if it was necessary to recreate the entire performance with 100% accuracy, and I don't know what it says about the film if its most exciting scene was a one-to-one -one recreation of something that already happened, but I admire the dedication. It really is impressive to see how dedicated the cast was to getting the performance exactly right. That goes for all the musical scenes, actually. Also, it was admittedly very touching to see all of the important people in Freddie's life, like Mary, Jim, his parents and sister, all watching his performance and rooting him, sorry, rooting for him. She's been rooting me uh, for me like you have for, <laughs> wow. Maybe longer even. <laughs> There are also a few cameos in the movie that I think are fun. Adam Lambert, the current vocalist for Queen, has a cameo as a trucker that Freddie hooks up with, and the guy who winks at Freddie towards the beginning of the movie is played by Luke Deacon, John Deacon's son. So while John Deacon wasn't involved in filming, he was still connected to the film in a way, and I think that's nice. And Brian May and Roger Taylor, as well as the film's editor, John Ottman, had cameos during the scene where Queen quote-unquote performs Killer Queen on top of the pops. So it is going to be playback. 
lip syncs all that's required. We do know how to play our instruments. You want me to lip sync? I don't know if you could call Mike Myers' role a cameo, but I kind of like that this character was literally invented for a Wayne's World joke. Well, that's the kind of song teenagers can crank up the volume in their car and bang their heads to. Bohemian Rhapsody will never be that song. It's dumb, but dumb in a way that I like, especially knowing that Freddie was able to see Wayne's World before he died and loved it. You, Mike, did get me the tape, and I took it round to Freddie not long before he went. He loved it. He just laughed and laughed. He was very weak, but he just smiled and laughed. Also, the little moment during the Live Aid performance where it cuts back to him sitting at his desk all sad during the line, no time for losers, is a pretty solid joke, and it's actually good editing? There are several solid jokes in this movie, actually. I've got better things to do my Saturday nights. I could give you their names. I also have to bring up this movie's big running joke of Roger Taylor being in love with or attracted to cars. What exactly are you doing with that car? It sounds bizarre out of context, but the joke stems from a very real song that he wrote called I'm in love with my car, which ended up becoming the B-side to Bohemian Rhapsody. Only because Roger Taylor locked himself in a cupboard and refused to come out until the rest of the band agreed. Interestingly enough, a similar incident happened almost 50 years later when the movie was being filmed. Halfway through Keep Yourself Alive is one of the most incredible, hard to replicate drum solos. I thought I'd convince Ben Hardy that uh, he's gonna have to do this. Oh, that he would have to actually play the yeah, drum this solo? crazy difficult drum solo. <laughs> <laughs> and how was that received? Oh, oh, he just uh, stayed up in his trailer and wouldn't come out. I don't think the joke is that funny anymore, but at the time, it was the funniest thing in the world to me. Ultimately, Bo Rap's strongest asset is its cast. And of course, I gotta say that this movie's casting is absolutely fantastic. Like, these actors aren't exact matches for their real life counterparts. Like, Rami doesn't look that much like Freddy, and Ben is way more of a beefcake than Roger ever was. But it really is impressive how close they managed to get. Like, I know everyone and their mother has already pointed this out, but Gwilym Lee looks so much like Brian May, it's actually kind of insane. I feel like even this movie's biggest haters have to admit that they really knocked it out of the park with the casting. Even the casting in smaller roles like Jim Reed or even Bob Geldof is just crazy, like the resemblance is uncanny. And in terms of the actual acting, all the performances here are really good, especially, in my opinion, Lucy Boynton's performance as Mary Austin. I feel like every time I've referenced the cast of this movie, I'm specifically talking about the four actors that played the four band members, so I just wanted to take a second and say, yeah, Lucy Boynton's performance was really good, although Brian May suggesting that she deserved to be nominated for a BAFTA is just kind of ridiculous. And again, it's not because she's a bad actress, and it's not because it's a bad performance, it's just that she's not given enough to do to warrant a nomination. There are actresses and performances that can completely steal the show, even with a limited amount of screen time, but that's really not the case here. And that goes for the other three band members as well. They're all giving really good performances, it's just that they're not given enough screen time and they're not really given enough to do. And I know for a fact that they're all great actors. Like, trust me, I have quite literally at least attempted to watch every single piece of media that Rami Malek, Gwilym Lee, Ben Hardy, Joe Mazzello, and Lucy Boynton have ever been in. When I say I was obsessed, I mean it. But, of course, the undisputed star of the show is Rami Malek as Freddie Mercury. Everyone praises Rami Malek's performance as Freddie Mercury, but I have kind of a hot take it's not that good. I think as time has gone on, there are more and more people on my side, but I've always been of the opinion that, like, it's fine, but it just comes across to me as an imitation rather than a performance. This was obviously a huge role for Rami Malek, and he was under a lot of pressure, 
but when you watch his performance, you can tell that he's constantly thinking about just how much pressure he's under. He also seems to really struggle with the prosthetic teeth in his mouth, which, fun fact, he got casted in gold after filming. Where do you hear the teeth right now? Right here, right In your now. heart, yeah. right? They're in my palm. You didn't, oh, like, yeah. oh. And before I say this, I'm, I'm genuinely not trying to be mean, and I'm not trying to say that Rami Malek is ugly. I've seen him in roles where I honestly thought he was pretty attractive, but he has some big eyes, and when combined with the big teeth, there are some scenes in this movie where he just looks bizarre. It's not a bad performance, it's really not, but it's definitely not the best of his career. If you haven't seen The Pacific, you definitely should, because both Rami and Joe Mazzello are giving the performances of a lifetime. What an amazing show. And of course, I have to mention Mr. Robot, because obviously, I think outside of playing Freddie Mercury, it's probably what most people know Rami Malek for, and for good reason. I mean, honestly, there are bits and pieces of his performance in that show that might be some of the best acting I've ever seen. That being said, the cast has great chemistry with each other, especially the four band members. The scenes we get of the band just hanging out and joking around with each other are the best scenes in the whole movie. You call me sweet like I'm some kind of cheese. It's good. Wow. And the cast were all great friends off screen too, which I think the fandom really latched onto. And I would know. I was a part of it. That was not a typo. Cardi B, the rapper, is not a part of this video, at least not until the end. This is the only segment of the video that is Bo Rap fandom specific. It's less about the movie itself and more about the fanbase it and Queen had, because the fanbase is a huge part of the Bo Rap experience. Because of the movie's PG-13 rating and extreme popularity, it accumulated a fandom, mostly teenage girls, who were obsessed with the band, the movie, and especially the movie's cast. And there's an important distinction to be made between Queen fans and Bo Rap fans, because while all Bo Rap fans are Queen fans, not all Queen fans are Bo Rap fans. So a Queen fan is exactly what it sounds like, just a fan of the band Queen, they enjoy the music, they enjoy the band, that's pretty much it. That's pretty much that's it! Pretty much it. But a Bo Rap fan, in addition to listening to Queen's music, is also a fan of the film and the film's cast, otherwise known as the Bo Rap Boys. Like any fandom, there were a ton of memes and inside jokes, which usually originated from one of two places, either lines or scenes from the movie. So it's a metaphor, Brian. It's I had a cold last week, if anyone cares. Oh. <laughs> Not the Not coffee, coffee machine. machine! Or footage of the real life band and things that they actually said. One and three seven sugars, please. I lost my shoes. My name is John Richard Deacon. I was born on August the 19th, 1951. You had jokes about Roger's whole car thing, which I mentioned earlier. You had jokes about Freddy's love of cats. You had jokes hating on Paul Prenter. You had jokes about Roger Rena, who was Roger Taylor's female persona in the music video for I Want to Break Free. And then you had jokes about Ben's recreation of that persona. But a majority of the jokes stemmed from the dynamic between either the members of the band or the members of the cast. Something I'm actually kind of surprised wasn't more popular is what I can only refer to as the pickled egg photo. It's this weird photo of Ben where he's like got his shirt off and he's holding two big jars of pickled eggs. Like look at this picture. What is going on? Whose idea was this? It's just such a bizarre concept for like a sexy shirtless photo shoot and also like pickled eggs? I can't think of a sexier food than pickled eggs. I don't know how to explain it without sounding insane, but this photograph has the same energy as that one photo of Adam Levine. Like you know it's supposed to be sexy, but it just makes you uncomfortable. I don't know, I just think this picture is weirdly funny, and considering the fact that Bo Rap fans liked to thirst over Ben and the other cast members anyways, I feel like there was a lot of comedic potential there. But anyways, these jokes took the form of what was popular in fandom spaces at the time, like text posts, those little roses are red poems, or incorrect quotes. So, like, so many incorrect quotes. 
and also those compilations on YouTube that people would make like Queen on Crack or the Bo Rap Boys being precious for 20 minutes or whatever, you remember those. And a lot of the fuel for this fandom fire came from the movie's press tour. For example, on any press tour for any film, actors kind of develop stories and anecdotes that they tell over and over again. Each member of the cast had one story that could be boiled down to one sentence. And if you were in the Bo Rap fandom, you probably already know what I'm talking about. With Rami Malek, it was Queen playing at Live Aid on day one. This one is self-explanatory. They shot Live Aid on day one. Which, to be fair, yeah, that probably is the most nerve-wracking part of the movie to begin on because there's so much pressure to get every movement right. With Gwilym Lee, it was... And then he came up to me and just started adjusting my wig. When the real Brian May first saw Gwilym in costume, he was so blown away by the resemblance that he stood in silence for five minutes, then started fixing Gwilym's wig. With Ben Hardy, it was... I told them I could play the drums. Another self-explanatory one. When Ben auditioned, he lied about being able to play the drums. Which, obviously, is why he locked himself in his trailer when he was told he would have to do a really complicated drum solo in front of Roger Taylor. Joe Mazzello was kind of a special case because he actually has three. Number one... Bohemian Rhapsody is the first song I ever downloaded on Napster. Again, it's self-explanatory, although I think this one in particular is interesting because Joe Mazzello was in The Social Network, in which Sean Parker, the founder of Napster, is a prominent character. And, as I mentioned much, much earlier, at one point, David Fincher was being considered to direct Bohemian Rhapsody. And number two... Mom, where were you in 1983? When he first saw a picture of John Deacon, he was so blown away by the resemblance that he called his mother and asked her where she was in 1983. And number three... I didn't realize that perm stood for permanent. As part of his role as John Deacon, Joe agreed to get a perm. But because he didn't know perm stood for permanent, he didn't realize how long he was going to be stuck with it. The entire cast, apart from Rami, had a huge social media presence, but nobody had a bigger presence in that fandom than Joe Mazzello. Overrated! Practically every joke, every meme, every big event can be traced back to him. Like, don't even get me started on the Bab dance. Actually, please do. I would love to talk about it. The Bab dance, Bab being B-A-B, -B, boss ass bitch, originally started as a behind the scenes clip that got posted to social media. And it became a huge trend with the fandom. Fans were doing it, the cast did it a couple more times, Joe even set up a hashtag on Instagram for people to post with, and he would then repost the best ones on his Instagram, it was a whole thing. I'm gonna be picking some of my favorite bad dances soon. I don't wanna say that the turn is still a disaster, I don't wanna say that, but I have to. And there was also this running joke that he and Ben and also sometimes Willem were in this bizarre love triangle. In any fandom, you're gonna have ships. That's just kind of par for the course, that's how it works. And the bow rap fandom was no exception. But never in my life have I seen an example quite like this of the cast of a mainstream movie taking the ideas and jokes and ships created by the fandom and absolutely running with them. And that brings us to Cardi B. Ben Hardy wasn't present for a good chunk of the press tour, I believe because he was filming something else at the time. So to all these promotional events, the cast would bring along a life-size cardboard cutout of Ben named Cardboard Ben or Cardi B, which I'm sorry, but that was actually very clever. Do you want to say a few words? <laughs> He's very shy. <laughs> Cardi B would tag along at all these press junkets and was featured in all the cast's posts on social media. They even filmed a bunch of sketches centered around Cardboard Ben's adventures. It's not big and it's not clever, Ben. No, we got safety be. first. That's Jesus. 
It's illegal in Asia. You've been in Tokyo for five minutes. And you're already getting kicked out of a club. My favorite thing to do is unpack right when I get home. Get all my stuff out of here. And you can really relax. Hey, mate! Mate! I've been in here for two days, mate! He did karaoke, he went to jail, he did the bab dance. Get the turn right! And most notably, he hooked up with Joe. Hey, man. <sighs> yeah, what happened last night? <laughs> Cardboard Ben was quickly integrated into the saga of Joe, Ben, and Gwillem's relationship. Outside of the running joke of Joe, Ben, and Gwillem's bizarre love triangle, there also began a running joke of Joe and Cardi B as a very dysfunctional couple. I'm leaving you. Oh, don't look shocked. You knew what this was when we started it. By the way, pretty much all of these clips are either from Joe's Instagram or his YouTube channel. And everything kind of came to a head in this clip. Oh, oh, you've got to be kidding me. This can't happen again, all right? It's done. I'm sorry. I'm leaving. Goodbye. Oh, you got it. Hey, buddy. Uh, yep. Hi. If you weren't in the Borat fandom, you couldn't possibly understand how huge of a deal this was. We all ate it up. <laughs> I don't know, I just wanted to talk about this whole phenomenon because I find it genuinely fascinating. First of all, I was a huge fan of these actors and it's kind of nostalgic for me, but it's also interesting to me that a film with such, we'll say misguided gay representation has a cast of presumably straight men who are very close and openly affectionate with each other to the point of jokingly pretending to be dating. You have me inside of Ben. Perverts. I'm on top of Ben now. Stop! That's not what that's supposed to sound like! You're... It's you, It's not me. You guys do this. I don't... I don't... No. I'm... The end. Family show. Goodbye. It was just a weird little thing to be a part of. Honestly, if you were in the fandom, I would love to hear from you in the comments down below. I'm curious, I want to know how you're doing now, if you're still a fan, and whether or not this video was like a brain blast for you. And I keep talking about the fandom in the past tense, but if you're still a fan, I would love to hear from you, even though you probably already clicked off the video because I was dumping on the movie pretty hard, and will continue to do so after this section is over. I think that, again, the reason people got so attached to this cast as a separate identity from the film was because they were and still are genuinely just a group of really close friends that were very connected to their fans, and we as fans were able to see so much of that friendship because of things like social media. We saw them flying out together to LA for the Oscars, getting snacks after the Oscars, falling down the stairs at the Oscars. It feels like we're we're segueing into something. It's easy to forget at this point in time, but Bohemian Rhapsody was a huge deal. It made almost a billion dollars at the box office, setting the record for the highest grossing biopic of all time. This movie was huge. Obviously, Bo Rep had its detractors, but it was extremely popular with audiences, and when awards season came around, it started getting nominated. And then it started winning! This movie was winning awards left and right, and because of the cast social media presence, we got to see all kinds of behind-the-scenes images and videos. Including this admittedly very heartwarming clip from the Golden Globes. The reason I bring up the Golden Globes in particular is because they're going to be important later, so keep that in mind. And when the 91st Academy Awards rolled around, it was nominated for five Oscars. Best Sound Mixing, Best Sound Editing, Best Film Editing, Best Actor for Rami Malek, and Best Picture. This caused a little bit of an upset because, I forget if I mentioned this earlier, but this movie was kind of controversial and there were a lot of people who didn't think the movie was very good. But as a fan of Bo Rep, watching this all go down, 
I was over the moon. I felt so validated because if the movie I liked so much really was that bad, then it wouldn't have been nominated. The Oscars are like the final word in film. They know what they're doing. Obviously, via the cast social media, as well as Brian May's, we were able to see snapshots of the entire night. Of the five Oscars Bo Rap was nominated for, it won four of them, all except Best Picture, and it had the most wins of any film that night. You might assume that I think the film didn't deserve to win any of them, but that's not entirely true. I will start by saying that this movie absolutely did not deserve Best Picture. I haven't seen all the nominees, but I have seen The Favourite and Black Klansman, both of which were better than Bo Rap. And it's worth noting that The Favourite is also a movie about a queer historical figure, in this case Queen Anne, and The Favourite handles its queer representation much better than Bo Rap did. Green Book ended up being the winner, which was also a strange, bad choice. And Bo Rap didn't deserve best editing either, I mean that was just insane, and people rightfully took the Oscars to task for it. There are two prevailing theories that I've seen on why it won. Theory 1, the scene sent in for consideration was Live Aid, which admittedly was edited together very well. Theory 2, the film's production was so disjointed and messy that editing the footage into a watchable film was an incredible feat of editing. The film's editor, John Ottman, responded to the backlash, stating that the film's poor editing was because of having to stitch together footage filmed by both Dexter Fletcher and the film's previous director. He essentially admitted that he wished he could go back and do things differently. And as far as sound editing and sound mixing, from what I can tell, these two awards often go to films that either heavily feature or are about music, so it's not really surprising to me that Bo Rap won, even though I don't necessarily think it deserved to. And I know I kind of clowned on Rami Malek's performance earlier, but boy did he deserve that Oscar. I don't know. I don't- I should have phrased it as more of a question. Did he deserve that Oscar? I remember at the time, a lot of people were saying that Bradley Cooper deserved to win for his role in A Star Is Born, and you know what? Maybe if he had won back then, he wouldn't have tried so hard to win this year. But look, jokes aside, despite everything I said earlier, I do think Rami's performance was great, I think he's a very talented actor, and I do think he deserved to win the Oscar. And I gotta admit, his acceptance speech was very touching. Listen, we made a film about a gay man, an immigrant, who uh, lived his life just unapologetically himself. And the fact that I'm celebrating him and this story with you tonight is, is proof that we're longing for, for stories like this. I am the son of immigrants from Egypt. I'm a first generation American. And part of my story is being written right now. Although we didn't thank the director of the film, which is like kind of weird, right? Like a best actor winner not thanking the director of their film is almost unheard of. Oh yeah, and then he fell down the stairs like immediately afterwards. So maybe Bohemian Rhapsody didn't get the big prize, but the Oscars was their night. In fact, the ceremony even opened with a performance from Queen and Adam Lambert. We are the champions indeed. Although it would have been kind of funny if they had done that whole opening performance and like did we are the champions and everything and then lost in every single category. I feel like every year something happens with the Oscars that starts a conversation about whether or not the Academy is like worthy of respect. And in 2019 it was Bohemian Rhapsody. There was also like a bunch of other stuff. The Oscars were kind of a mess that year. People did not like Bo Rap winning so many awards, especially given its problems, especially when Rocket Man was paid dust the following year. Okay, I made it this far into the video without mentioning Rocket Man even once, but now I'd appreciate it if you'd allow me to go on a brief tangent about Rocket Man! Rocket Man is a biopic based on the life and career of Elton John. The film was released in 2019, and the lead role was played by Taron Egerton. Rocket Man gets compared to Bohemian Rhapsody all the time, to the point where to this day it kind of lives in Bo Rap's shadow. And to be fair, there are a few pretty notable similarities. 
First of all, Rocketman came out a little over six months after Bohemian Rhapsody, which does kind of look like it's trying to ride Bo Rap's coattails a little bit. They're both biopics about iconic queer musicians of the 70s who, in real life, were close friends. Both films were at least partially directed by Dexter Fletcher. The two films also have the same costume designer, Julian Day. They both feature John Reed as a character, although in very different ways. And the two movies even have several scenes that look, sound, and feel very similar. Say, it's really great. It's shit. It's fantastic. Would you like to hear us again? Not really, no. I remember the first time I watched each of these movies, I even reacted to those last scenes in the exact same way. It was something along the lines of, Oh my what god! What is this song? This goes oh. so fucking hard! In fact, the connection between these two films is so strong that Rami Malek was supposed to have a cameo in Rocketman as Freddie Mercury. It was cut from the film because Dexter Fletcher thought it would be too cheesy, and I kind of agree, but like, I wish they would have kept it. Like, it's dumb, but it's dumb in a way that I like. But there are a lot of key differences. Bo Rap presents itself as a straightforward retelling of true events, where Rocket Man is meant to be more of a fantastical reimagining of the way things really happened. I would say that these two films have about an equal amount of disrespect for historical accuracy. I just don't know as much about Elton John as I do about Queen. I'm sure if I looked hard enough, I could find just as many historical inaccuracies in Rocket Man, if not more. The difference is that Rocket Man explicitly presents itself as a fantasy, whereas Bohemian Rhapsody is trying to convince you that it's telling the truth. Another key difference is that in Bo Rap, Rami Malek is lip syncing, whereas in Rocket Man, Taron Egerton does all of his own singing. You want me to lip sync? So in Bohemian Rhapsody, anytime you hear Freddie's voice, it's either being taken from an old recording of the man himself, or it's being done by Mark Martell, who is a singer who just so happens to sound a lot like Freddie Mercury. Send shivers down my spine, body's aching all the time. Taron Egerton does all of his own singing in the film, which you can hear on the movie's original soundtrack, and he also sang some of it live on set. Although, in Bo Rap's defense, Freddie Mercury's voice is a very difficult one to replicate, unless, I guess, you're Mark Martell, and Taron Egerton was explicitly told by Elton John to kind of find his own interpretation of the music and sing with his own voice rather than try to replicate Elton's perfectly. So I'm gonna give Rami a pass, but you know, clearly it worked out just fine for him. Rocketman also has an original score, which Bo Rap does not. Bo Rap is a very crowd-pleasing PG-13 movie where Rocket Man is rated R. This, of course, means that the movie doesn't have to restrain itself. It's not limited to just implications. We actually see Elton doing coke and having sex. And both movies seem to have a very different understanding of and attitude towards their subjects. I'll put it like this, and this is kind of a minor, minor spoiler for Rocket Man. It's literally the first scene in the movie, and it's also like a real thing that really happened, so it's like not a huge deal, but if you don't want to hear it, just skip to this timestamp. In Bohemian Rhapsody, Freddie's most triumphant moment is playing a concert at Live Aid with his band in front of over a billion adoring fans. In Rocket Man, Elton's most triumphant moment is leaving a concert and checking himself into rehab. I'm going to be talking a lot more about Rocket Man in the very near future, so for now, I'm only going to be talking about it in the context of comparison to Bo Rap. And I'll be so honest, I used to be a certified Rocket Man hater. When it first came out, all anybody wanted to talk about was how much better it was than Bohemian Rhapsody, so I initially refused to watch it out of some kind of weird, childish loyalty to Bo Rap. But eventually, my curiosity got the best of me. I didn't know that much about the movie, only that it was starring the guy from Moomin Valley, which is one of the greatest pieces of queer television ever conceived, and I was astounded. If you were to ask me, now, today, what my favorite movie of all time is, I would tell you that it is Whiplash, still, it's still Whiplash, but a close second would be Rocket Man. But I can admit that Rocket Man is not perfect. Realistically, it's like an 8 out of 10. 
It has moments that are kind of dumb and goofy, and it still follows the exact same formula that every musical biopic does, but what makes Rocketman so interesting and so good is what it chooses to do with that formula. First of all, Rocketman was made with the involvement of Elton John himself, kind of like how Bo Rap was made with the involvement of Brian May and Roger Taylor. But Elton chose to go about things very differently than Brian and Roger did. Elton was openly critical of Bohemian Rhapsody and the way it handled Freddie's story. When Rocketman was in development, producers reportedly wanted a PG-13 rated film just like Bo Rap, and Elton refused because he didn't live a PG-13 rated life. Elton wanted people to see him for who he was, and still is, the good, the bad, and the queen. Rocketman is such a lovingly crafted film. While Bo Rap is really nothing special from a technical perspective, Rocketman genuinely has so many super cool shots and really well-directed musical numbers, it's visually just an awesome movie. The movie also has its own original soundtrack, which is really fantastic. I love the way this movie is a bona fide musical. It's such an interesting way to experiment with the traditional structure of a biopic. Rocket Man did not achieve even a fraction of the commercial success and accolades that Bo Rap did, even though, in my humble opinion, it is far and away a better film. It feels light years ahead of Bohemian Rhapsody. The gay representation is much more explicit, and the conflict of the film comes from Elton's unresolved childhood trauma and deep self-hatred, not his relationships with men. If you removed Elton John's music from Rocket Man and pretended the movie was about some random guy, you'd still be left with a compelling story about trauma, addiction, and redemption. If you removed Queen's music from Bohemian Rhapsody and pretended it was just about some random guy, you wouldn't be left with much of anything. Rocket Man was only nominated for one Academy Award, that being Best Original Song, which it won. The film was not nominated for Best Picture, despite being nominated for a Golden Globe for Best Musical slash Comedy. Taron Egerton was not nominated, despite winning a Golden Globe for his performance. You may remember that Bohemian Rhapsody was nominated for Best Sound Mixing, Best Sound Editing, Best Film Editing, Best Actor, and Best Picture. I'll level with you. Rocketman was a better film in every single one of these categories. It's not the best editing or sound mixing I've ever seen in a film, but it really has its moments and is definitely less of a mess. And I'll say it, Taron Egerton's performance blows Rami Malek's out of the water. To be completely fair, I think this comes down to a difference in script. Really the main appeal of Rami's performance comes from it being a really good Freddie Mercury impression. In terms of actual acting, he just doesn't have much to do. But with Taron Egerton as Elton John, he gets to scream and cry and throw tantrums and it's ultimately a much more interesting and emotionally moving performance. And obviously I'm not trying to say that screaming and crying automatically makes a performance good because it doesn't and there's something to be said for subtle performance, which Rami Malek has in Bohemian Rhapsody. He's able to convey a lot of emotion with his movements and his mannerisms, and he adds a lot of depth to Freddy that absolutely is not there in the original script. But there's a lot of subtlety and nuance in Taron's performance too. Obviously he has these bigger moments, but honestly the quieter, more introspective moments of the film is where he shines the most. He completely sells you on the insecurity and vulnerability and emotional torment that Elton is going through. So why wasn't he nominated for an Oscar? Well, 2018 and 2019 were very different years in terms of film. 2019 was genuinely stacked with so many films and performances that we still talk about today, and 2018 in comparison just didn't have as much staying power in terms of the films that came out that year. For example, Rami Malek was nominated against Christian Bale in Vice, Bradley Cooper in A Star Is Born, Willem Dafoe in At Eternity's Gate, and Viggo Mortensen in Green Book. They were all good performances, I'm sure, but they're not really roles that we're talking about today in 2024. And now we'll take a look at Best Picture. We have Green Book, Black Panther, Black Klansman, The Favorite, Roma, A Star Is Born, and Vice. Again, 
I'm sure they were all fantastic films, but how many of them are we still talking about today? Taron Egerton and Rocketman as a film deserve to be nominated for more Oscars, but with such a stacked year, they just couldn't have been. Taron Egerton was up against a lot of really good performances, like Leonardo DiCaprio in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Adam Driver in Marriage Story, and Joaquin Phoenix in Joker. Rocket Man as a film was up against movies like 1917, Little Women, The Irishman, Parasite. There was just no chance. Honestly, I think the reason Taron won the Golden Globe is because the Golden Globe splits their nominations by genre. I don't think he really stood a chance of winning otherwise. His performance as Elton John was absolutely incredible, but it's definitely not the best of his career. If you haven't seen Blackbird, you definitely should, because both Taron and Paul Walter Hauser are giving the performances of a lifetime. What an amazing show. Ultimately, Rocketman deserved just as much attention and success as Bohemian Rhapsody got, if not more. When it comes to the Oscars, I think Rocketman kind of just got dealt a bad hand, whereas Bo Rap got off pretty easily. Rocketman deserved to be nominated for more Oscars, but that just wasn't possible in the environment it was released in. I'm gonna wrap this up by saying that Rocketman is a fantastic film that deserves to be talked about outside of its relationship to Bohemian Rhapsody. And I think that because Rocketman came out afterwards, the cast and crew of that film had to bear the brunt of these comparisons, and I don't really think that's fair. One thing I would like to say and take this opportunity to say is that inevitably the film has drawn comparisons with Bohemian Rhapsody. Rami Malek's performance in that movie is astonishing and I'm lucky enough to know him a little bit personally. Dexter knows him quite well. He's the nicest, most brilliant man and, and, and one of the most talented actors of, of our generation. And I'm very, very proud that we are mentioned in the same breath. That film has been such a global phenomenon and success and rightly so it is a great rip-roaring piece of entertainment and it's great fun i can't remember who did that and who finished it off actually. Can't <laughs> <I>? <laughs> um, <laughs> i'm very grateful that people compare us and hopefully it shows that there is an appetite for movies of this nature and um However, that movie is a unicorn, and I don't want to be forever judged. <laughs> anyway, Rocket Man is really good. <laughs> Rocket Man is... We're very proud of Rocket Man. We're very proud of Rocket Any Man. Any questions you have about Rocket Man, <laughs> we are more than happy to answer. Also, you should watch Rocket Man. It's good. This concludes a brief tangent about Rocket Man. So, like I said before, Bohemian Rhapsody was extremely successful at the Oscars, more successful than any film released that year, and... The Oscars kind of ended the Bo Rap era on a high note. The 2019 Oscars kind of marked the end of the road for Bo Rap, and it's hard to believe it's already been five years. So let's check in on everyone, see what they've been up to. It's been five years since Bohemian Rhapsody first hit theaters, and although it's probably safe to say that this film's moment is over, you can't deny the impact that it left on the film industry. Obviously, there have been biopics before, there have been biopics about musicians before, but Bo Rap's success at the box office and at the Oscars opened the floodgates to a multitude of Oscar bait biopics about literally any musician you could possibly think of. Those last two are being produced by GK Films, which is owned by Graham King, the same person and the same company that produced Bo Rap. Fun fact, GK Films also produced the film Rango, which includes Isla Fisher in its voice cast. Isla Fisher is married to none other than Sasha Baron Cohen. Oh, never mind. The film also revived interest in Queen. It introduced their music to a new generation of fans, and their latest tour in North America with Adam Lambert actually sold out. John Deacon still stays out of the public eye, but Brian and Roger still enjoy Queen's and Bo Rap's success. Brian's actually been going on about a sequel that most likely will cover Freddy's death, just like the original version of the film was supposed to. Nothing's actually been confirmed yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if we did get a sequel down the road, though I have no idea who would direct it. So what about the cast of the film? I'm gonna be going one by one through our colorful cast of characters, and it's at this point in the video that a lot of people I haven't mentioned in a long time are gonna start coming back again. 
I'm also going to be pointing out a lot of connections between the cast of Bohemian Rhapsody, the cast and crew of other films and TV shows that we've talked about previously, and just a bunch of other random people in Hollywood because I think that kind of thing is really interesting. Obviously, Bo Rap was a huge boost for Rami Malek, who is now a mainstream celebrity. Obviously, he won an Oscar, but I think what people forget is that his first big role after Bo Rap was Doolittle, in which he played an animated gorilla. Another interesting connection he shares with Taron Edgerton. I think that is such a fun little piece of trivia, and I can't for the life of me tell you why. I never get the opportunity to share that tidbit with other people because First of all, nobody cares. Second of all, nobody remembers Doolittle. But I don't know, I think it's fun. And I just love animated gorillas. He was in that movie with Denzel Washington that nobody saw. He was in the latest Bond film. And interestingly enough, so was Ben Wishaw, who you'll remember was supposed to play Freddy before Rami was cast. I wonder if they ever talked about that. He even hosted an episode of Saturday Night Live and honestly did a pretty decent job. Give me more treats! Oh, sure, I'll give you a treat. Give you a one-way trip to hell. Oh, Martin, no. His monologue was about how, throughout his career, he's played a lot of villains, which is true. Safin in No Time to Die, Josh in Until Dawn, and Freddie Mercury in Bohemian Rhapsody. Lucy Boynton's career also took off after her role as Mary Austin. She's not on Rami Malek's level of stardom, but considering the fact that they had been dating during his upward trajectory, she got a lot of attention as well. They ended up splitting in 2023, and he's now dating Emma Corrin. You may know them from their role as Princess Diana in The Crown, which you'll remember was created by Peter Morgan, who was supposed to write the script for Bo Rap. It's all connected. Now listen, I am not the kind of person that cares about celebrity couples and who's dating who, but what makes this couple so fascinating to me is that the real Freddie Mercury was close friends with the real Princess Diana, meaning Rami Malek has now dated two people who famously played two of Freddie Mercury's real life close friends. Now we need to find someone else who famously played one of Freddie Mercury's real life close friends so Rami can date them next. And don't get me wrong, Lucy Boynton is a very talented actress in her own right, and she's had a ton of big roles since. She was in shows like The Politician and Modern Love, and she had starring roles in movies like Chevalier and The Pale Blue Eye, and she also had a small role in Barbie, which is pretty ironic considering Rami had a much less small role in Oppenheimer. That means that Rami Malek has had a major role in the two highest grossing biopics of all time, because Oppenheimer broke Bohemian Rhapsody's record. She also became an icon in fashion and makeup, and ultimately she became very successful because of this film. Gwilym Lee was in The Great, which was a pretty popular show, and in Top End Wedding, which was a cute little movie. You may recognize these two lead actors, Elle Fanning and Nicholas Holt. They both star alongside Gwilym Lee and The Great, but they've also each been a part of previous projects with Ben Hardy. Elle Fanning was Ben's co-star in Mary Shelley, and Nicholas Holt, who friends of the channel will remember from my video about the good, the bad, and the queen, not only had a role in The Favorite, but was Ben's co-star in those X-Men movies. Who directed those again? Ben Hardy has since had a few big roles in more mainstream movies. He was in that Michael Bay film, Six Underground, playing a character named Four. Last year, he starred in a drama called Unicorns, as well as a Netflix rom-com with Dexter Fletcher. I should probably clarify that Dexter Fletcher was an actor in this movie, he didn't direct it. Joe Mazzello hasn't been up to much. He had a recurring role in American Crime Story and was in a movie called Unexpected, but other than that, it's been pretty quiet from him. And no, I haven't seen anything from Cardboard Ben either, although Joe was making content with him as late as 2022. The cast still clearly keeps in touch and remains friends though, and they clearly built a close and lasting friendship despite, or possibly because of, the difficult working conditions on set. Speaking of, of course, the film's director, Dexter Fletcher went on to direct Rocket Man, as well as Ghosted, which somehow was Apple TV's most watched film debut. Good for him. So, whether or not the film was any good, its success at both the box office and the Oscars elevated pretty much everyone who had a hand in the movie. Except for the film's original director. 
I obviously made several references to this person, the fact that he created a very unstable and hostile work environment, and the fact that he was fired. And though it's likely that you already know who this person is and what he allegedly has done, I wanted to wait until the end of this video to talk about him because it's a lot to unpack, it's a lot of very heavy and disturbing content. He is inseparable from this movie, regardless of the fact that he was fired, and you cannot have one without the other. I cannot sit here and talk about Bohemian Rhapsody without also talking about Brian Singer. Before I start this segment, I need to let you know that this segment will contain discussions of rape and the sexual abuse of children. If these topics are disturbing or triggering to you, please skip to the next segment or stop watching altogether. It's really not worth it. I should also say that all of the testimonies and stories I'm about to cover are all allegations. I want to be very careful about how I cover this issue, and more than anything, I want the alleged victims' voices to be heard. So I'll be linking all of the sources I'm drawing from in the video's description. I would encourage you to seek those out to hear their stories directly from them. And I want to make it clear that I don't think this video should be anyone's only source of information on this topic, so I'm not going to go into every single detail of these allegations because I do think that you should read these articles and these testimonies in full. Obviously, this is a very sensitive issue and I want to cover it respectfully and properly, and there are a multitude of accusations that have been leveled against Brian Singer, but in the interest of honesty and integrity, I am only going to be covering the accusations that have been published and substantiated by a reputable source because with a topic like this, with something this serious, I don't want to contribute to any spreading of misinformation. Brian Singer, director of Bohemian Rhapsody, has been accused of several counts of sexual assault of minors over the course of nearly 30 years. In 1997, a 14-year-old extra named Devin St. Alban accused Singer of asking him to strip naked for a shower scene in his film Apt Pupil. Two more extras, 16-year-old David Stockdale and 17-year-old Ryan Glomboski, came forward to support his claim. The boy's family sued Singer for infliction of emotional distress, negligence, and invasion of privacy. The result of the lawsuit isn't public information, some sources say the case was dismissed for insufficient evidence, and some say it was settled out of court. A lot of the alleged situations that these children were placed in were made possible by a company named Digital Entertainment Network, or DEN, which shut down in 2000. This was a multimedia company founded by Mark Collins Rector and Chad Shackley. The two were a couple who had started dating when Shackley was 16 and Collins Rector was 32. DEN had a number of high-profile investors, including Brian Singer. The company operated out of a mansion in Los Angeles where they would host parties, which were attended by a number of celebrities as well as underage boys, who were allegedly given drugs and alcohol and sexually assaulted by older men, including Brian Singer. DEN ended up going bankrupt and shutting down after both Mark Collins Rector and Chad Shackley were accused of child sexual abuse. Collins Rector was found guilty of transporting minors across state lines for sexual purposes. Brian Singer was also named in a lot of the testimonies given by these underage boys, and the majority of alleged incidents I'm about to cover took place at these parties hosted by DEN. In 2014, actor Michael Egan came forward, claiming that in the late 1990s he had been sexually abused by Singer from the ages of 15 to 17. He specifically accused Singer of rape and forced intoxication. The case was eventually withdrawn. That same year, another anonymous man accused Singer of sexually assaulting him when he was underage. This case was also dismissed by the accuser. And a documentary was released titled An Open Secret, centered around exposing child abuse in Hollywood, particularly the abuse facilitated by DEN. The allegations against Brian Singer were originally included in this documentary, but were removed after Michael Egan withdrew his lawsuit. In 2017, 
A man named Brett Tyler Skopik claimed to have been in a relationship with Brian Singer when he was 18. He describes being taken to expensive dinners and lavish parties, being given drugs, and being coerced into sex with Singer and with other older men. He claims that Singer promised him roles and connections in Hollywood in exchange for sexual favors. That same year, three days after Singer had been fired from Bohemian Rhapsody, a man named Cesar Sanchez Guzman alleged that he was sexually assaulted by Singer in 2003. He sued Singer for emotional damages, and in 2019, Singer agreed to pay $150,000 to resolve the allegations. Also in 2019, The Atlantic published an extensive report in which four more men accused Singer of sexual assault. The day before this report was published, Bohemian Rhapsody was nominated for five Oscars. Victor Valdivinos, another 13-year-old extra from Apt Pupil, claimed that Singer had molested him on set. Three other men alleged that Singer had raped them throughout the late 90s. Two were 17 at the time, and one was 15. A month after this report was published, Bohemian Rhapsody, a film Singer directed, won four Oscars. And I need to make it clear that Brian Singer and other people who have done the things that he has been accused of doing are nothing more than symptoms of a bigger issue. The film industry is one that will take advantage of vulnerable people, especially children. We have seen it happen time and time again. Brian Singer is not the first person to be accused of things like this, and he won't be the last. He's not even the only person I've mentioned in this video that has been accused of sexual harassment or sexual assault. In 2021, another young man named Blake Stewerman came forward with a story very similar to the one shared by Brett Tyler Skopik. He allegedly met Brian Singer when he was 18 and trying to break into the entertainment industry. Singer took him to dinner, gave him alcohol, and then sexually assaulted him. Singer then convinced Stewerman to move to Los Angeles, where they continued their sexual relationship, all while Singer promised Stewerman that he was going to turn him into a millionaire. He, like so many other young men, described being subjected to mental, emotional, and sexual abuse that caused him severe trauma. And all of these accusations, save for Blake Stewerman's story, were compiled and published in one piece by the Atlantic, and that report marked a major turning point in Brian Singer's career. While Singer denied these allegations, he retreated from the public eye and has remained quiet ever since. It's unlikely that he'll ever find work in Hollywood again, and if he does, he will never be able to reach the status he once had. And his final film to date was Bohemian Rhapsody. Brian Singer directed Bohemian Rhapsody. The two are unequivocally connected. When Bohemian Rhapsody makes money, Brian Singer makes money. When Bohemian Rhapsody gets awards, Brian Singer gets awards. It doesn't matter that Dexter Fletcher was the one to finish the film. It doesn't matter that Brian Singer didn't show up to the Golden Globes or the Oscars. Brian Singer is credited as director. His name is on the project and will be forever. Bohemian Rhapsody is his movie, and he was rewarded for it in spite of everything. During the press tour for Bohemian Rhapsody, whenever the cast was asked about Singer, they did their best to avoid directly mentioning Singer's actions, all while celebrating and promoting the film he directed. Um, I have to ask now with the benefit of hindsight, how big of a hurdle was Brian Singer's departure and do you share the award with him? Um... Not something I really should talk about tonight. It's a good question, though. Rami Malek, notably, didn't thank him in his Oscars acceptance speech. He also confirmed that working with Singer had been unpleasant and expressed solidarity with the alleged victims. However, he claimed that he hadn't been aware of the allegations when he signed on to the film. It's not up to me to say whether or not that's true, but Singer was attached to the film before any of the cast was confirmed and several of the allegations against Singer were public information before the majority of the cast signed on. Rami Malek, Gwilym Lee, Ben Hardy, Joe Mazzello, Lucy Boynton, they all chose to work with him after this information was made public. The entire cast had access to this information. 
Brian May, and Roger Taylor had access to this information. If we're to believe Sasha Baron Cohen, they had control over who got to direct their film, and they chose and approve of and posed for pictures with a man who had been accused of raping children multiple times. In this situation, I don't believe it's possible to separate the art from the artist. From the very beginning, Brian Singer's influence and reputation are inseparable from the final film. We see Freddy being demonized for throwing lavish parties and sleeping with men. We see Freddy showing up late to work, drunk and high, and starting fights with his bandmates. Bohemian Rhapsody claims to be a story about Freddie Mercury, but in the film, Freddy doesn't act like Freddy. He acts like Brian Singer. Brian Singer allegedly sexually assaulted underage boys, then was given Brian May and Roger Taylor's approval to direct a film about Freddie Mercury that completely mishandles his life, personality, and sexuality in a very uncanny and sinister way and it made him millions of dollars and won four Oscars. This is undeniably the final nail in this movie's coffin. Everything we know now about Brian Singer completely changes the context of the film, and I, I can't support it anymore. I just cannot view it in the same way. And let me state again, these are all allegations. Brian Singer has not been charged with anything. He has not pled guilty to anything. But whether or not these allegations are true, Brian Singer's reputation now precedes him. Obviously, Brian Singer didn't write the film screenplay and he wasn't responsible for its story, but I just find it very disturbing that Brian Singer directed a film in which the protagonist attends drug-fueled parties and sleeps with other men, which jeopardizes his career and leads to his downfall. And behind the scenes, he was allegedly attending drug-fueled parties and sexually assaulting underage boys. The way in which this film chooses to demonize Freddy's sexuality, which is arguably its biggest flaw, takes on a very different light when you consider what Brian Singer was allegedly doing behind the scenes, the consequences of which bled into the film's production. Given the circumstances and the people responsible for them, Bohemian Rhapsody could never have been a good film, and even if it had been, it wouldn't have justified the success it had and the awards it was given in light of what Brian Singer did, allegedly. I wish I could provide you with a better conclusion, but I just can't. Like, this is it. This is what lies at the center of Bohemian Rhapsody, and this will be the legacy of the film forever. Because from now until the end of time, Bohemian Rhapsody will be Brian Singer's film. Which means that Brian Singer will forever be tied to Queen and to Freddie Mercury. So you didn't feel, uh, you didn't feel compelled to talk about him on stage? You didn't feel like it was appropriate? Uh, we, we wanted to, I will take this one. There's only one thing we needed to do and that was to celebrate Freddie Mercury in this film. Uh, he is a, a marvel. There is only one Freddie Mercury, and nothing was going to compromise us giving him the love, celebration, and adulation he deserves. I'm just going to add that every single person that worked on this film collaborated and, and did it out of the passion of making this story. That was everybody. Thank you. I want to end this video the same way I started it. In December of 2018, I went to the movies with my best friend at the time to see Bohemian Rhapsody. I was a kid, and I was extremely sheltered, and I had never seen same-sex attraction represented on screen. I had never heard the word bisexual said on screen. I had never seen a movie about someone like me. When I started working on this video, something I didn't really understand was why I loved this movie so much when I first saw it. I didn't understand how I couldn't see all the flaws that this movie so obviously has. And I actually think it's pretty simple. I think I became attached to this movie because it was my first real taste of queer representation. 
regardless of how flawed that representation was. And I know I can't be the only person who felt that way. It's worth noting that Jojo Siwa was publicly a huge fan of this movie and of Queen and of Freddie Mercury before she came out. Obviously, I don't know her and I don't want to project anything onto her, but I I don't think that's a coincidence. Number one is 100% Bohemian Rhapsody. I am the worst person to watch Bohemian Rhapsody with. I actually, my girlfriend and I will do movie nights and I tell her, I'm like, I want to watch Bohemian, but like, you're gonna kill me. And one day we did on FaceTime together and she was trying to do homework and I was watching it and I'm just saying every line as it's happening. She's also friends with three different influencers who've been accused of inappropriate behavior with minors. That's an interesting coincidence, isn't it? But I wouldn't be surprised if she saw this movie and saw herself represented in it. I know I did. But now that I'm a grown up, and now that I've seen other media with much more healthy and respectful queer representation, I feel like I can finally see the forest for the trees. Bohemian Rhapsody was doomed from the start. It suffered from Brian May and Roger Taylor's involvement, and then suffered further at the hands of the director. It's a confused mishandling of Freddie Mercury's story and a malicious depiction of his character. I've been wondering for a while now if this movie and my obsession with it had a negative impact on my view of myself and of queer people in general. Obviously I can't speak for everyone, I can only speak for myself and my own experiences, and all I know is that this movie was incredibly important to me and marked a very important period in my adolescence. If I hadn't seen this movie, I wouldn't have seen myself represented on screen and I wouldn't have been able to admit to myself that that was who I was. I would never have been able to embrace or even acknowledge that part of my identity. Although honestly, I think if I hadn't seen Bohemian Rhapsody, I eventually would have watched something else about a queer character and had the same emotional response to it. But that's not what happened. I watched Bohemian Rhapsody and it became a huge catalyst for me. I can recognize this movie's personal significance to me and be grateful that I was able to take what I needed from it and still recognize that almost everything about this movie is deeply, deeply flawed and harmful. I think while this movie gave me the courage to do and be things I couldn't before, it kind of planted this seed in my subconscious that I could only be a presentable version of who I was or I would risk losing everything. As a very insecure and angsty kid, I saw so much of myself in this funhouse mirror version of Freddie Mercury who struggled with himself and was desperate to be loved. I became terrified of estranging myself from my loved ones and losing myself in the process. I really hope I'm not the first person to tell you this, but being queer is not a flaw or a vice, and it's not something you should have to control or hide. The people who truly love you will love you regardless of who you are and should want you to pursue the life you want to live. You deserve to live openly, honestly, and unapologetically, just like Freddie Mercury did. And I wish I would have known that when I was younger, and I wish I had been able to see this movie for what it is and always was. It's an insult to the queer community, specifically queer men, and it's an insult to Freddie Mercury's legacy. And it's such a shame because Freddie lived such a genuinely interesting life and it's such a compelling story. He was one of the most talented and creative vocalists ever to have lived. How long have we got? Five minutes. Five, ten minutes. Five, ten minutes. <laughs> he fled to the UK from Zanzibar as a young man. He was a graphic artist and designer as well as a musician. His final live performance drew a crowd of over 200,000 people. Fred, how do you feel uh, playing and singing before 200,000 people? I haven't done it yet. And more than anything, he was a great friend, a hard worker, and an incredibly resilient man. He never revealed his sexuality to the public, but he was hounded by the press about it for the duration of his career and his life. 
And of course, he contracted an illness that was highly, highly stigmatized at the time, and he faced so much prejudice because of it. When he became visibly sick, the question asked by the press turned from, is this man gay, to is this man dying? The thing that annoyed me more than anything was a shot of Freddie in the sun. And he just come out of the doctors, I think, and it was really grainy, full page shot. Is this man dying? I thought you fucking wankers. And despite everything, he refused to alter or censor himself. He refused to try and justify his lifestyle to the public, because why should he? Do you have hobbies? I have not done yeah, a lot of sex. Try and get out of that one. And even in the final months of his life, he was fully dedicated to his music, coming to the studio to record until he physically couldn't anymore. He wasn't in a great state. He was finding it hard to walk, even finding it hard to sit because he was in a lot of pain. I played him the stuff. He said, it's brilliant. I was singing, I, will, I can go for it. He said, bring me the vodka. <laughs> he brought him the vodka and he pours himself a shot, knocks it down, and then he props himself up so he says, another one, knocks another vodka back, he says, okay, go for it, and he went for it, and those notes came out of him, and I don't know where they came from, those are very, very high notes, for, even for Freddie. I'm never giving in, oh, the show. He knew he was dying, but he didn't let it defeat him, he kept going and going until he couldn't. He didn't release a public statement confirming that he had AIDS until the day before his death. And even at the very end, he made sure to think of his friends. Freddie loved collecting Japanese art um, and collecting an auction. So while he was dying, he was still buying things at auction. They, he would be surrounded on the bed and there'd be medicine all around him, medicine cabinets, pills, but auction catalogs. And it was astonishing. I thought, this is amazing. This man has such a love of life that he's not thinking about dying whatsoever. He's still thinking about living. And I collect a painter called Henry Scott Tuke. A Christmas morning came and gave me this, um, this pillowcase. His drag name, my drag name is Sharon, as you read in the book. Freddie was Melina, as in Melina Mercury, the Greek actress. And it, in this beautiful pillowcase, was this water color of Henry Scott Tuke. And in the note that went with it, it said, Dear Sharon, I saw this at auction and thought you'd love it. I love you, Melina. And, well, you can imagine how much I cried. And I, it was really moving. Um, and he was dying, and he still thought of his friend, and he bought me this. That's the kind of person he was. He was so full of love and life. I don't think I've ever met anyone quite like that. How would you like to be remembered? Oh, I don't know. I haven't thought about that. Dead and gone. It's up to them. When I'm dead, who cares? I don't. <laughs> Freddie Mercury deserved to have a movie that uplifted him and celebrated him, all of him, exactly as he was, and he didn't get that, not even from his own band members. So if you want to watch a film with a great soundtrack featuring healthy gay representation starring Rami Malek, just watch Night at the Museum. Thank you so much for watching this video and sticking around till the end. I hope you thought it was interesting. This is a topic that I genuinely could talk about for like a thousand years. And I know it got kind of heavy at a couple points and a little bit serious. So I have included a bunch of links and resources in the description for pretty much every single one of the more sensitive topics that I talked about. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to give it a thumbs up. And if you liked me, be sure to subscribe to my channel. If you want, you can even turn notifications on so you'll be the first to know when I'm dining at the Ritz. We'll meet at 9. Precisely. Anyways, that's gonna be all from me. I've got to go. Bye! Not from the top, make it drop. That's some wet ass pussy. Now get a bucket and a mop. That's some wet ass pussy. I'm talking rock, rock, rock. That's some wet ass pussy. Macaroni. Macaroni.
macaroni, 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 macaroni in a pot. Wet ass, p-word.